So I wanted to take a couple minutes on uh, World Carnivorous Plant Day to talk about one of my favorite carnivorous plants, Heliumphora. And uh, this is probably one of my favorite species, McDonaldae. Uh, talk a little bit about where they're from and how they grow in the wild, but I want to kind of focus more on how I grow them. Um, not that this is like a how-to guide, but uh, just some things that I've found out in my few years of growing here in Florida. So, first of all, they come from tepuis in South America, primarily Venezuela, I believe. So these are just like high, flat mountain tops. Um, they're frequently referred to as rain deserts because not much else grows up there, and they're uh, frequently like wind-blown rainstorms. Uh, so it's cool, wet, and lots of bright light. So <clears throat> these can be intimidating to grow because those are understandably difficult conditions to try and duplicate. One of the things I've found out is that you don't necessarily have to keep them as wet or as humid as you might imagine. You can see from the live sphagnum moss here that uh, it's starting to dry out. <clears throat> it's definitely not like plump like you would expect in a high humidity environment. And that's because I grow these in house humidity. Right here we're at 57%. The high today was 60, um, and uh, it's kind of averaging at 67, 68 degrees. <clears throat> I try to get them down to 60 at night, and I try not to let them get over 78 during the day. Um, so basically, <clears throat> once they're hardened off, the live moss and being grouped together with other plants can kind of help boost local humidity and uh, you can have a pretty happy plant it's got a flower um, <clears throat> these pictures are close to a foot tall I'll measure them here in a second uh, so yeah watering definitely want to use high quality water reverse osmosis distilled or uh, rainwater. I find in my conditions I'm watering them daily so the way I tend to water is I will fill up the pitchers and then in the uh, it's in a different place on different species but right around the waist there's a vent and the water will fill up and then slowly drain out and so that gets the rest of this moist and what doesn't get moist enough I'll finish off with a spray bottle and get it uh, nice and, and plump and lush looking again and I usually do that at night the idea being that that helps with the uh, temperature drop I've got a little straggler utricularia quilty growing in there um, <clears throat> so yeah the the watering at night and the evaporation at night helps reduce the temperature in the root zone. That's also the reason for the ventilated white pot. I use a nice, loose, almost Nepenthes mix. Live sphagnum moss, or I'm sorry, uh, long fiber sphagnum moss, dry. I like the chunky perlite. is a turfus or MVP it's like a fired clay not like a fired clay it's a fired clay <clears throat> um, and that leaf lends itself to a really readily draining mix that doesn't necessarily stay soggy but can still retain some moisture um, let's see what else feeding so Obviously, you can feed them insects, but uh, sometimes it's more convenient to feed them 
concentrated fertilizer pellets, uh, Osmocoke. I'll show that here in a minute, but um, that's kind of why I left this half dried up burned pitchers. Um, first of all, because if there's green on it, it's still contributing to photosynthesis and still it's still got fluid in it, can still digest. So it's it's not as pretty as some of the other pitchers, but it's still serving the plant well. But also because those pellets can sometimes burn the pitchers. So I'll wait until the pitcher starts to fade naturally, and then that's the one that I'll kind of throw the, the Osmocote pellets into. Um, and then, let's see. I've got a couple of the other things that I use nearby. I'll show that here in a second. So there's the Osmocote, just a pellet. Throw one in there. I don't know, every four weeks or three weeks or something like that. Um, this is a soil additive, great white. Uh, it's basically got microorganisms that are beneficial to the root zones. And then a lot of people think snake oil super thrive. When I get a new plant or I divide a plant, I soak them in these two things as per the directions for a gallon, um, usually overnight. And then I'll either pot it up if I'm receiving the plant or if I'm dividing it, uh, then start dividing it. And there's been a number of occasions that the plant just doesn't seem ready to come apart yet they can be kind of brittle. Um, I'll let it soak for a couple of days. Uh, it doesn't seem to hurt the plant and they recover pretty quickly if you uh, if you bag them and then I slowly harden them off by removing material from whatever container I use to boost local humidity or bag it. Um, as I see new growth, I remove a little bit more, and then you end up with, at a certain point, which is pretty much it's up to the plant, as it grows and, and does better and better, you remove more and more until basically you just have like a, a plastic wall, whether that's a water bottle or a giant Ziploc bag or what, whatever you use that works for you. Um, and then at some point you decide, okay, the whole thing's going to come off. Or I've had other plants where, you know, it lives like that with a little plastic wall around it for six or eight months. And then ultimately they, they all do pretty well in house humidity for me. Um, I can't say all species, but I have quite a few different species and obviously hybrids. Uh, you know, Miner does fine, Parva does fine, um, let's see, Neblinae does good for me, um, Ciliata, Chimatensis, um, again, hybrids also do quite well, but I guess that's a little bit more expected. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Definitely a very rewarding plant to grow. Always kind of reminds me of like prehistoric times or uh, for some wild reason, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Happy Carnivorous Plant Day. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.